Hello, I'm Jonathan Aldrich, a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. I wrote the fifth edition of this textbook, Programming Language Pragmatics, with Michael Scott, who wrote the first four editions of this textbook. We're excited about the text, which has in-depth coverage of many programming language topics from a pragmatic point of view. We hope you'll pick up a copy and read it. Now, it's helpful to have an instructor to go with the text and introduce you to the material. For many people, that's a professor in your class. But in case you're studying on your own, or your professor can't, doesn't cover all the book, we're providing these videos to help more people understand all the cool content on programming languages. We'll cover the material in short segments to make it digestible. We assume you have significant experience with at least one imperative programming language. Other than that, we'll start with the basics. It's going to be fun, so let's get started. We'll start with sections 1.1 to 1.3 of the book on programming languages and why we study them. An important part of the philosophy of our text is that language design and implementation go together. Someone who is implementing a language has to understand that language to make sure that the implementation is correct. A language designer has to understand implementation issues to make sure the language can be implemented efficiently. And of course, a good programmer has to understand both. Because as a programmer, you want to write programs that are correct by using the language constructs appropriately, that are understandable to other programmers who you're working with, and are efficient so that the program runs quickly. Therefore, we'll be talking about both the language designs and the implementations uh, as we go along. Now, why are there so many programming languages? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a story of evolution. Over time, we've learned better ways to do things. And so while early programming languages might have used go-to statements to uh, control flow from one part of the program to another, now we use structured con programming constructs such as if statements and while loops. Different languages are used because of socioeconomic factors, things like proprietary interests. For example, if you want to learn to write a an iPhone app, you might want to use the Swift programming language. But if you want to write an Android app, you might want to use Java. And so there are network effects as well. When a bunch of people learn Swift so that they can program iPhone apps, then that language is, gets uh, uh, lots of good libraries developed by those programmers. And so other people want to use the language for that purpose as well. Some languages are good for special purposes. For example, JavaScript is good for web programs, whereas Rust is very good for systems programming. Some languages are good for running on particular hardware. Uh, for example, the CUDA language is good for programming GPUs. And finally, there are a lot of personal preferences. Different people have different ideas about what works well and prefer different programming languages for their own reasons. Now, we can also think about what makes a language successful. Some languages are successful because they're easy to pick up. I learned to program from BASIC. Maybe you learned to program from Python or Logo or Scratch. Some languages are very powerful. Uh, C++, Common Lisp, Scala, and Rust are all languages that have lots of interesting and powerful constructs that you can use in, uh, in a, uh, to write sophisticated programs. Some programming languages are easy to implement and freely available. And so uh, a fourth is a very simple language that's easy to implement and was used on a lot of early machines. Uh, Pascal was famous for having a very simple uh, bootstrapped sequence that could uh, enable implementations to uh, be set up quickly on lots of different machines. Uh, Java was also kind of written in this way. Sometimes safety is a selling point for languages. So there was a transformation in uh, languages uh, in programming when Java came out uh, 30 years ago um, and provided a language that uh, avoided a lot of the security vulnerabilities of C in earlier languages. Now Rust is doing the same thing for systems programs today. Uh, some languages are standardized and may have many uh, good implementations. Um, and so there are standardization processes for C and Java and C Sharp and JavaScript and many other languages. Uh, many Languages have open source implementations. Uh, I list C here because it was one of the first uh, to kind of democratize open source, but there are many others. Uh, some languages are known for producing efficient code, which might mean fast code or might also mean slow, co uh, small code. Some languages have a powerful sponsor backing them. 
So if you're in the Microsoft ecosystem, that might be a good reason to use C-sharp. Um, for a long time, Ada was a preferred language for the Department of Defense applications. And of course, Swift is a preferred language in the Apple ecosystem today. Finally, there's market lock-in. 40 years ago, a lot of people were writing programs in COBOL, and those programs might not have been replaced yet. And so you might, if you want to maintain those programs and uh, improve them for the current day, you might have to learn COBOL. And in fact, people who know COBOL are... Uh, you know, find good job prospects in maintaining those uh, older programs. Uh, and similarly, JavaScript is is uh, a lock in, is kind of locked in for the web. When we think about programming languages, there are a couple of different viewpoints: the programmer side and a computer side, because a language is really an interface between the programmer and the computer. Don Knuth said, a computer programming is the art of explaining to another human being what you want the program to do, what you want the computer to do. So if we look at the programmer's view, the language is really a way about thinking and expressing algorithms. But from the implementation side, the language is really an abstraction of a virtual machine, right? The programmer programs on top of a virtual machine, which is the language constructs, and then a compiler will transform uh, that virtual machine down and, and run it on another machine, perhaps another virtual machine or maybe a real machine like uh, like a uh, Intel computer or something. So when we think about this, uh, both conceptual clarity really from the programmer's viewpoint and efficient implementation from the implementer's viewpoint are fundamental concerns. We quoted Don Newth, so let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, we'll go through some programming language people uh, throughout the textbook uh, who have contributed to the history of programming languages. Don Knuth is a professor emeritus at Stanford University. Uh, he's well known for the design analysis of algorithms, uh, many of which he describes in The Art of Computer Programming, his uh, series of texts. Uh, Don Knuth also invented the tech typesetting system, which we use to typeset uh, our textbook, uh, Programming Language Pragmatics. He's known for the literate programming methodology where you explain what a program is supposed to do in natural language and then you intersperse it with the actual code uh, so that you can read them together and understand the way the code works. Uh, Don Knuth won the ACM Turing Award in 1974. Let's talk about different language paradigms. So, on the one hand, uh, probably most of us are familiar with imperative languages, languages like Python, C, Java. Uh, these languages really talk about how we want the computer to do something. Uh, but there's other styles of languages, for example, declarative languages that are more focused on what the computer is supposed to do. And then these break down into other lower level uh, divisions. Uh, for example, uh, functional programming sits kind of between declarative languages and imperative languages. Um, Whereas uh, von Neumann uh, style languages like C are much more on the imperative side. And then there's purely declarative languages such as Prolog, SQL, and even Excel. Let's take a little deeper dive into what these categories are. So declarative languages tend to be higher level. They're closer to the programmer, closer to the problem, but a little further from the machine. They focus on what the program should do and let the compiler take care of how it should do it. One example is logic or query languages. So if you have a problem that looks like a little logical puzzle, then Prolog or Datalog could be great languages for expressing that in a very direct form. Uh, SQL is also a language uh, in this category because you're describing the data that you want to get from a database. And so logic and query languages really are about finding values that satisfy some constraints that you express in the language. Data flow languages, on the other hand, model computation is parallel flows of token that pass through one computation, are transformed, and then go to another uh, token. They're a little bit less common, uh, but you do see them out there. Uh, there are also constraint-based languages, such as Excel and CSS, uh, that express constraints to be solved or maintained, right? So if I write a formula in Excel, uh, and then I change one of its inputs, then the formula will transform that data and, and update the output as well. Similarly, CSS expresses the constraints that talk about how a web page should be laid out, and when you resize your browser, those constraints are resolved so that they're maintained over time. Finally, functional languages, such as Haskell or Scheme, 
describe side effect free computation of outputs for inputs. Uh, they support a very mathematical view of computation um, and support unbounded computation using recursion. On the other side of the picture, imperative languages tend to be more algorithmic. They're a little less abstract, they're a little closer to the machine, and they focus on how the program should operate. So von Neumann languages, like C or Fortran, express computation as the modification of variables, right? And, and if we want to do an unbounded amount of work, we probably have a loop in the program to, uh, to compute uh, multiple times until our computation is complete. Object-oriented languages are organized in a little bit of a different way. Uh, languages like C++ and Java structure computation by distributing it among different objects, each of which pairs data with the methods that operate on that data. Finally, scripting languages emphasize flexibility and ease of programming, gluing components together. Uh, so this is something that both Python and JavaScript are good at, Python for command line programs, JavaScript for web programs. And of course, these, uh, these paradigms may overlap. Uh, so going back to our earlier slide, C++ is a language that is both uh, good for writing kind of better C programs in a, in a von Neumann style, but also provides object-oriented constructs. Python is an object-oriented language, but also provides von Neumann and constructs and is good for scripting. Uh, Scala is a nice language at the intersection of functional programming and object-oriented programming. Where did this uh, von Neumann language come from? Come from? Well, uh, John von Neumann, uh, was a mathematician and a computer pioneer, uh, and he helped to develop the concept of stored program computing. This is the model that underlies most computer hardware today. In this model, both programs are da and data are represented as bits in memory, and this is brilliant because you can manipulate the program, you can even write new programs by putting data into memory. And so the processor kind of generically fetches, interprets, and updates that representation. So if we want to understand some of these different paradigms, we can look at a single program written in three different language families. So for example, the first program is, th this program is a simple program that is used to compute the greatest common denominator of two integers using Euclid's algorithm. What it does is it repeatedly replaces the larger of the two integers by the difference between them. And when the two are equal, then the value is their answer. So C shows an imperative or von Neumann approach to solving this problem. Uh, we have a while loop uh, that runs until A is equal to B and then repeatedly replaces either A or B with the difference between the two numbers depending on which one is larger. Finally, it returns the result. Okay, so very focused on how the computation works. OCaml is a bit higher level. Uh, so this is a functional programming language and we define uh, GCD as a recursive function. Uh, so we test if A and B are equal, return A if so. Uh, otherwise, we'll make a recursive call to the function, but with one of the numbers replaced by its difference. And so where the, instead of a, this loop that we saw in an imperative language, we have recursive calls in the functional language. Finally, prologue might look a little bit unfamiliar, but it really has the simplest and shortest description of what's going on. It's directly capturing the logic of the algorithm. So the first case, uh, we have A, B as inputs, and G as the output. Um, so Prolog will just find the output from the inputs here. Um, and uh, so if A is equal to B, then we set G equal to A. Uh, otherwise, uh, if A is greater than B, then we create some C, which is A minus B, and, and uh, then the uh, G is defined by using this constraint again. So there's a kind of recursion there, but it's, it's higher level uh, more, more what than how, even than something like OCaml. And then there's the final case uh, for when B is greater than A. So three different, very different languages, three different paradigms, all computing the same program. Let's do an exercise to check our understanding. Think about two different programming languages that you know. For each, name one advantage of using that language. Okay, do you have your answer? Probably everyone has a different answer to this question. I'll tell you mine. I like Rust because like C, it gives me full control of what the computer is doing. 
and I can write fast and tight code, but it's also a safe language and provides great programming abstractions. I also like Scala. Scala is great for writing algorithms at a high level of, of abstraction and also writing clear code in a functional programming style. So when I want to do higher level programming tasks, I might often choose Scala instead. So why should we study programming languages? Well, when you have a new project, studying programming languages might help you choose a language that's good for it. Think about what kind of project Rust is good for versus JavaScript versus Python. Very different models, very different markets. Programming, studying programming languages can help you learn languages more easily because you can leverage concepts that cross-cut languages, things like types, things like control structures. Finally, studying languages can help you make better use of languages and language technology. It can help you understand obscure features when you need to. It might, might help you choose alternative ways to express things, for example, based on which is more costly. Uh, it can help you use tools such as debuggers, assemblers, and linters effectively. It can help you learn how to work around features missing from your language, right? If you can understand how to compile recursion, if you're in a language without recursion, and there are some, uh, then you can program it up yourself. Finally, languages are everywhere. Configuration files, extension languages, scripting. And you may one day find it important to design and implement one yourself. So that's it for today. Uh, next time we'll come back and start in depth in our study of programming languages.